Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show exploring the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. What does it mean to be the best at something? To simply be better at it than everyone else? For one man from South Georgia, being the best led him to the NFL. The path to success was punishing, and in the process, Nate Lewis will tell you, he lost who he was. Now he is on a journey to try to help his brain function like it used to. In his suburban Atlanta neighborhood, Nate Lewis tackles the asphalt hills, each painful step a reminder of the price of love. For Lewis, that love affair began when he was just 10 years old, growing up in the South Georgia town of Moultrie. It's all about football down there. It was the football field, a green oasis in a town baked and browned by relentless summers. I was just like obsessed with the, the smell of the grass. And so I used to get up in the morning, put my cleats on, and just go run on the grass. If it was fresh cut, oh, that was emotional. It was on the grass that Lewis and everyone who watched him play realized he had a gift. And I was out running there. I would jump higher than them. A running back turned wide receiver his senior year at Colquitt County High School, Lewis was recruited to the University of Georgia. Nathaniel Lewis of Moultrie, Georgia, high in the air. With the ball tucked under his arm, his beloved green field spread before him, Lewis was unstoppable. You hear your heart beat, you hear yourself breathing, and you don't hear nothing. And all you just focus on where you have to go. Yeah, that's what I love to do. By the time Lewis was scoring against Georgia Tech and Clemson, he says he had already suffered concussions. Although they didn't call them concussions, it was getting your bell rung. About 14, 13, 14 years old, you actually do see stars. You, your eye, you can't see, you can't focus. Lewis remembers what the coaches would say. Like he said, you all right, you all right? I was like, no. He's like, well, come on, just take, a, take one play off. I took a playoff. I wasn't right. And then the NFL came calling. Then the NFL, everyone is fast. Everybody fast. Everything's happening quicker. A childhood passion had led him to the top. In his six years playing for the San Diego Chargers and the Chicago Bears, the hits kept coming. How did they treat you for concussion when you got one? Ice on top of my head or on my neck. In the NFL? And besides ice? That's it. That was it. That's the only th treatment I got. A pastime was now serious business. Lewis says he played through pain and confusion so severe, there are entire days of his career that are a blank. His wife, Sherry, reminds him of one time. The one that you got on the plane. And that was Denver. That was Denver. And he said that doesn't remember the trip home. He, um, you know, didn't know where he was. Seven years after he left football, Sherry says Nate changed. He would get enraged over nothing, a drawer left open, a shoe on the floor. Very argumentative, lack of communication. He built a wall. What else did you see? Confusion. A look in his eye that just didn't feel the same. We had a good connection, and it just seemed like <clears throat> he wasn't there anymore, and he didn't love me. It didn't take much to set him off. Did you feel a lot of rage? Yes. What were you mad about? Not being able to do, not being able to hold a thought. Not being able to hold a thought. And because uh, it's like, you know, I don't want my wife to think I'm dumb. You know, I've been to college. I, I was able to do these type of things, but I can't do it no more. Sherry would learn Nate was suicidal and thought often of crashing the 18-wheeler trucks he now drove to make a living. If I was just drive off this, drive off this cliff, everything explode, that'd be, that'd be it. 
they were on the brink of divorce. Then came the turning point. Junior Seau was one of the best known players in the yeah, NFL. An apparent during suicide his... by a powerful athlete, a force of nature on the football field. Junior Seau, Nate Lewis Chargers Junior teammate Seau and friend, killed himself. It was heartbreaking because the story that they told behind it and the tr struggle that he was going through. And I'm like, wow, I'm going through the same stuff. The autopsy would show Seau's brain had CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a progressive degenerative disease of the brain found in people with a history of repetitive brain trauma, such as concussions. How many concussions have you had? I can't count. I can't really count. I mean, because... Five? More. 10? More. 20? Yeah, but I'll say about that or more, 20 or more. Nate and Sherry say Junior saved their marriage and Nate's life. He got help. He now takes medicine to deal with the headaches, depression, anger, and attention issues. All right, how are you doing today? Good, how about yourself? I'm good. Glad to see you. Same here. At Emory Brain Health Center, he is doing ecologically related neuro rehabilitation to try to help his brain function better. Uh, write the names down. Distinguish the physical facts of the okay, person. Good. W-O-P-R. Write, organize, picture, rehearse. This is Nate's life. He takes a notebook everywhere, writes what he needs to remember, organizes it, paints a mental picture, and rehearses recalling the information. Today, Nate is working on remembering names and faces. Do you remember this guy's name here? Mmm. We talked about the mustache. Larry, uh, I remember he played tennis, right? He played tennis. Larry Carlton. Larry Carlton. That's right. Booyah. Good job. <laughs> Excellent work. Yeah, yeah. It's right. not the thrill of a touchdown, yeah. but it is a victory. And those happen rarely for Lewis these days. Well, certainly our nervous system has tremendous capacity to heal itself. What we do in rehabilitation is we try to facilitate that spontaneous recovery. And, but even more importantly, particularly when we're talking about cognitive abilities, what we really are trying to do is to teach people to make really good use of their preserved cognitive skills. This rehab isn't new. Emory neuropsychologist Dr. Tony Stringer used it with patients who suffered brain injuries in car accidents 20 years ago. He developed WOPR and other strategies that help patients like Nate deal with reasoning, problem solving, and attention deficiencies. That's why athletes concerned about their concussions are now seeking out Dr. Stringer. Stringer's research is showing some remarkable outcomes in brains of patients diagnosed with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, an early form of dementia. Working with researchers now at the University of Michigan and Penn State University, they compared people with MCI to people with healthy brains. The orange indicates activity in the brain while they perform tasks. In the MCI brains, far fewer areas are lighting up before cognitive rehabilitation. These brains are from patients who actually have gone through cognitive rehabilitation, and you can see they look a lot more like the healthy controls. A lot more activation in the frontal part of the brain, which is the part of the brain that really becomes engaged when we're using a strategy to compensate for memory difficulties. Essentially, other parts of the brain can pick up the slack for parts that no longer function as they should. What researchers know about the long-term impact of concussions on a brain is constantly evolving. The research is too new to show if rehab could delay onset of brain disease. And, you know, my heart, anyone's heart, I think just has to go out to the athletes because, you know, they put everything on the line. And I think oftentimes they don't even realize what they're putting on the line by just playing the sport that they love. While Lewis comes to grips with what he can and can no longer do, he is also coming out. Until now, he has told no one of his struggles, including his own family in Moultrie. The secret they shouldered alone for 15 years will now be shared. His family not knowing and us doing this has just opened up another door. It feels good, it feels good, and it feels scary. Lewis hopes he has found a new way forward off the field, one that can lead him to a life free of suffering. I love you, I love you too. 
Nate is on a maintenance program using cognitive strategies on his own. He sees Dr. Stringer and his therapist every four to six weeks for booster sessions. He's also learning to accept that he will always grapple with cognitive challenges. Did you know that the natural vibrations of cars can make people sleepy, even if they're well rested and healthy? This is a big problem when you consider how much time we spend in our cars these days, especially since 20% of fatal crashes involve driver fatigue. In a study out of Australia, volunteers were tested in simulators that mimic driving on the highway. Well, after just 15 minutes of testing, those volunteers showed signs of drowsiness, drowsiness that peaked at the 60 minute mark. The research is ongoing, but the hope is that future car seat designs could include something to fight this vibration-induced sleepiness. What's the difference between enjoying something and being addicted to it? We know people can be addicted to many things, from food to alcohol to drugs. Now add video games to the list. The World Health Organization has named gaming disorder as a mental health condition in its international classification of diseases. We take a look at gaming disorder, what it means to video gamers, and their brains. It looks like a Christmas morning race down the stairs, but instead of presents beneath a tree for the Watt brothers, there is this. That race is because whoever gets there first lays first. It's sort of dystopian, like the Hunger Games, where it's a battle royale, and then it comes down to one person who wins. Fortnite is a far cry from your father's video games. I get irritated a lot. You can't stop. You can't pause the game. I don't want to say it's addictive, but it is addictive. I started to feel like it was unhealthy um, when they started playing. Bro so often that... Oh, he put a trap down. When I called them, they got irritated. Shoot the rocket, shoot the rocket. When they couldn't pull away from it is when I started to realize it was unhealthy. Or when their response to me was disrespectful as a result of me pulling them away or interrupting. It's a slickly produced, intense game of survival, and currently one of the most popular in the country. They really got into Dawn and Jawanza Watt do not allow their boys any technology during the school week, which can turn weekends into free-for-alls. I think the amount of time that is consumed is unhealthy. The World Health Organization's definition of gaming disorder includes behavior that lasts for 12 months, gaming taking precedence over other interests and daily activities, and playing the game despite negative consequences, whether it's trouble at work, school, or at home. What would your boys choose to do over video games? Sports. Sports. Two of them for sure would much rather sports over video games. Don, do you agree? No. <laughs> Why do I keep on getting hit? You're on your own, man. This battle is playing out in homes across the country. A battle of balance. How to allow gaming without it becoming a problem. It's important we recognize people are truly struggling with this. Emory Brain Health psychiatrist Dr. Justine Welsh is an adolescent addiction expert. We actually see um, a kind of common thread between the release of the chemical dopamine which is largely responsible for the sensation of pleasure and reward in the same area of the brain. And to the same degree or magnitude um, that playing a game has for someone who may be addicted to it versus using alcohol and other drugs. So gaming is as addictive as other addictions? It can be. As with other addictions, Dr. Welsh says gamers develop a tolerance, meaning they need to play longer to get the same dopamine reward. And we also sometimes see a withdrawal syndrome where someone be can become anxious or irritable when limits are set or the games are actually taken away. And some of those symptoms really closely mimic the symptoms that we see with substance use disorders. Yeah. Oh shoot, no, people. I felt in asking other parents to share their struggle that in this case, I should share mine, the one lurking in our basement. Oh shoot. My son Jude is 13, very 13. We limit his playing time, 
not a popular decision. You don't think that we should limit your video game playing time? No, 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 no. You should totally limit it because uh, I agree that all boys would be on it for hours and hours. My poor to foot now. My friends, their parents don't even care. Like, one of my friends are on six hours a day. I can't fact check that last statement, but I do think it's interesting when Jude explains how he feels after playing for a long time. I get actually very bored and mad and my head gets angry and I get really frustrated. Is his frustration because he's addicted or because he's a 13-year-old boy? <sighs> the World Health Organization says the actual number of addicted gamers is still small and must be clinically diagnosed, but it's smart to pay attention. What are the screen habits? How much time is the child or adolescent spending? And what are they playing? And what really happens when you set limits? My son will argue our limits are killing his social life. He meets up with his friends online. So do the Watt brothers and millions of adolescent and adult gamers across the country who have virtual gaming friends. Girls now account for almost half of players. It does create kind of the social environment for them. Um, they connect with kids they probably wouldn't connect with at school, as an example. There's strategy around it, there's you know critical thinking and things like that that I like about it. It's a very new diagnosis. We still have a lot to learn about it. More research is underway, and long-term impacts of too much gaming are not known. Treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy, a talk therapy that helps people adopt healthier behaviors and thoughts. The battle for balance will rage on in homes across America, with some parents still clinging to the hope that video games do not reign supreme. I think you'll have at least one of them will say that there's other things they prefer to do than video games. And I would call that denial. <laughs> <laughs>well, it is giving us insight into why we overeat and how our craving for carbs and fat are making us overweight. Our final story is about expectations, how they're lowered when receiving a devastating diagnosis, and how they're exceeded when a passion is discovered, one so strong that even a rare genetic disorder cannot stop it. A young man playing a trumpet. It could be a glimpse inside a typical suburban home. But nothing about Joshua Grant is typical, going back to before he was even born. I was laying there and the girl said, Oh, I see it's a boy. We see the little turtle. And I was like, what? She was like, yeah. And then she went, mm. It was very low, like it wasn't dramatic. It was like a, mm. Tuberous sclerosis, two words Cheryl Grant had never heard, two words that would change the course of her life and that of her son. Tuberous sclerosis affects the brain, the eyes, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, so it's a lot of different organ systems that could be affected. The rare genetic disorder that affects 50,000 people in the United States causes benign tumors and masses called tubers to grow in the brain and other vital organs. Joshua's brain has many tubers, but also had a giant cell astrocytoma tumor, a type associated with tuberous sclerosis. So if this is the size of a five-year-old brain, the tumor was half that size. It was gigantic. 
The surgery to remove part of that tumor dramatically impacted the left side of Joshua's body and his cognitive function. He's a probably about along the lines of a 15-year-old, 14, 15-year-old. Uh, sometimes, like if someone asks me a question, even if it's a yes or no question, it still take me a while to answer because I have a cognitive delay. Joshua works at the cafeteria of a nearby elementary school, using the stronger half of his body to compensate for the half that struggles with basic tasks. Biggest thing is you have to make sure that this thing doesn't become your God. You will use it as an excuse for everything if you let it. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Emory neuro-oncologist Dr. Soma Sengupta manages Joshua's disorder. Harsh chemotherapy and invasive brain surgeries have been replaced, for the most part, mm -hmm. with drugs that now target specific pathways, keeping the tumors in check. Can you show me the hand again? Okay. It's kind of, like I said, it's kind of tense right now. Mm -hmm. Botox helps to loosen his hand and the left side of Joshua's body, but there are many tubers in his brain that cannot be removed. You have a triangle uh, where it's just kind of bright and brighter than it should be, and when that's disrupted, that's a, an area of, uh, of injury or, or abnormal tissue there. And you'll kind of see other areas throughout where uh, they're scattered throughout. I, I mean, it's hard to, to give like an accurate estimate, of, but I would say it's more than 10. And pro probably many more than that even. Compared to normal brain, this is very abnormal. I mean, there's large regions of the brain which are, are completely different than they would look in a normal brain in uh, someone like you or I. There is an area of Joshua's brain that is interesting to his doctors. It's the part not ravaged by surgery and genetic disorders. Music and language and auditory processing are kind of in similar in similar parts of the brain. And uh, then a lot of that is done through the, the lower parts of the frontal lobe, so like down here, in which his brain is relatively normal in, in that area. The first time I noticed was um, he was in his car seat and he was humming. And I was like, I didn't know babies hummed, you know. <laughs> in a life filled with valleys, this 22-year-old has found his peak. Joshua Grant is a jazz artist with his mouth, with his one hand, with all of himself. What music does for me is it helps me forget about my frustrations. I feel kind of like an outcast. So does music make you not feel like an outcast? It does. He wants to bring jazz to millennials. You know how you're in traffic, you're at a red light, and there's that one person. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, <laughs> things of that nature. But uh, I want to put that with jazz music to see what it sounds like. His musical ability provides an unlikely soundtrack in a life filled with love and struggle and an unknown future where life-shortening complications often lurk. This is like a surprise because you don't know what you're unwrapping. In between her two jobs, Cheryl unpacks boxes in their oh, new home. I love this picture of you. Look at that red clay dirt down home. You are so happy. I wouldn't change anything. It's made me a better person, like it's made me a more sober-minded person. It's made me more strategic, like I think more now globally. 
I see the value that everybody brings to the table now that I have this child, even my own self-worth. And I think it's just made me just a better person. He has the best outlook of anybody I know and does not complain. And he's, you know, I raised him, but he's so much better than I am, and I'm so glad. <laughs> it's not near as petty as I am. <laughs> Tuberous sclerosis stole a lot of dreams. His mother says music brought them back. Oh, I want him happy. I, you know, I just picture him somewhere in France playing music and meeting people and having a home of his own. In a world that has not always welcomed him because of his differences, Joshua does not yearn for a different path. He wants to give back. I hope that whatever I attend, intend to accomplish, it be for not only for my good, but for the good of people besides myself, you know? Because what, what good will it do if it's just benefiting myself and nobody else? I'm just glad to be living. It's the little things that flourish into big things. Medical interventions control his tumors, but Joshua and his mother also have a positive outlook. And they have not had an easy life, but they're grateful, even for the hard parts, a lesson we'd all do well to remember. That does it for us this week. We'll see you next time on Your Fantastic Mind.